Friends, this initiative is with the leadership of Agrarian South Network, a tri-continental research platform, and it's in co-partnership with ActionAid Association India and the Sam Moyo Institute for Agrarian Studies, Harare, Zimbabwe. The dialogue, and I acknowledge it here, is with thanks and support of our other supporting partners, the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University in India, the Institute of Agrarian Studies at the University of Accra, Ghana, Global University of Sustainable, a virtual university at Hong Kong in China, the postgraduate program in World Political Economy and Educational Technologies and Languages Unit at the Federal University of ABC, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Friends, the dialogues are in English and are going to be relayed here now on the as well as on Facebook. Recorded videos you will see here later and will have Portuguese subtitles. In case you have uh, questions, at the question and answer session later in the day today, uh, these could be asked in other languages. Friends, this is a session on nationalism. Today's session is on nationalism. It devotes its, itself to the question of nationalism. Pitfalls of nationalism. And if I may add, it locates itself in the new wave of nationalisms, mostly chauvinistic and quite distinct from the last waves. We have an eminent pan-Africanist, an activist, we know him, Lisa Shivji, and we are honored to have you, Professor Shivji, here with us today. You've been a mentor and an inspirator to me, and Professor Shivji will lead this talk, and will deliver this talk later this evening. Professor Zotsi Sikata, a research professor at the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana, is our discussant tonight. Zozi is a well-known women's rights activist, and Zozi will reflect on Isa's talk later in the day today. But before Professor Othman, Professor Kamata, and Professor Shivji to kindly display the book for us, and I am going to call for a formal launch of the book. Thank you. A big applause, friends. This is the new book. You can see it on your screen there with Professor Othman. It looks very nice, ma'am. <laughs> A virtual applause. Professor Saida has done the first volume of the book, my friends. And without further delay, I will request Professor Saida Uthpan to give her reflections and her introduction to the first volume of the book. I invite you, Professor Uthpan. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Uh, and thanks very much to the uh, webinar organizers for giving us this opportunity to launch our book. This is actually our first launch, virtual or otherwise, so we are very grateful. Unfortunately, all of you are muted, so we didn't hear the deafening applause that you must have given yes. when we launched the book. So the book is in three volumes, as Sandeep said, and uh, written by three authors, and that's not a usual thing for a biography. So that actually presented our first challenge when we started writing the book. Uh, how are we going to harmonize our approaches, our styles, our voices? And that exercised us quite a bit. But uh, fortunately, we hit upon the idea of uh, each one of us uh, needing the writing of uh, each book. So I am uh, uh, the lead author of uh, book one which is called uh, The Making of a Philosopher Ruler. And that allowed us also to sort of uh, focus more in our areas uh, of uh, interest in which perhaps we are most competent. So myself as a discourse analyst, I had great fun writing uh, chapter three of uh, book one, which talks about uh, Nyerere's uh, legendary uh, 
oratorial prowess, his uh, poetry, his uh, passion and the promotion of Kiswahili, and uh, also the translation of uh, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar and the uh, Merchant of Venice, which were extremely well received. Julius Caesar sold 11,000 copies in the first three years. I can't imagine that happening now, for instance. Well, the other thing is that we, we took us six years to write the book, and that's a very long time, but perhaps not so much for the three volumes. But what, what that meant was that um, along the way, we kept losing our prospective interviewees. So one after, these are people who work with Malibu. So they would have been, they, they would have been very old, well, fairly old uh, men and women. So we kept losing them on the way and we lost several over the course of the six years, unfortunately. And at times, of course, one of us would be more recalcitrant and Isa had to rein us in as it were, but happily we finished the job, okay? Then we have uh, the outcome now, as you have seen, and uh, we are, surprisingly, we are still uh, friends. Uh, now, we, we were attempting to write the story, not only of the man, but also of, uh, of the nation and how the two molded each other. And uh, Nyerere himself was uh, quite a great storyteller, but regretfully, he never got around to, write, to tell his own story. And he didn't want anybody to tell it as long as he was alive. In fact, on uh, uh, one of the first pages of book one, it says uh, there, there's an inscription from Nyerere himself in his own handwriting, where he says, I will be very happy if my story is told when I am dead. I will not complain then. So we feel very privileged that we've been able to uh, write this book and to finish it. Uh, now, the book is called The Making of a Philosopher Ruler, as I said, and I'll just touch on now uh, the uh, mismatches that occurred between the philosophy and the ruling, between the philosophy and the practice of Nyerere. So for example, Nyerere was a feminist. Right from the beginning, he was a great feminist. So he wrote this uh, remarkable book, remarkable for the time. This was 1944. He was only 22 years old and an African man. So he wrote this uh, uh, very uh, interesting, a uh, book on the subjugation of women. And he derided uh, the practice of uh, uh, bride price and uh, polygamy. And he equated bride price to women's slavery, that women were bought for money, okay? And then when they got divorced, the woman had to return the money to the husband and so on. So he, he, felt, very, he felt very strongly about that. But then nine years on, when he wanted to, to marry himself, he wanted to marry his wife, Maria, Maria's mother said, uh, no way, you're not going to get my daughter without paying the bride price, okay? So he, without paying the obligatory 12, well, the obligatory cows were 25. But Maria's mother said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll let you give us 12. So you never had actually to borrow the money in order to pay uh, the bride price for Maria. Very reluctantly, of course, but he had uh, to do it. Uh, he also was a man who was uh, completely devoted to the nation. He spent his entire life uh, working for the nation, trying to develop the nation and uh, developing a philosophy so, uh, 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 through the Arusha Declaration, which would guide the, 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 the nation through uh, the early years. But uh, unfortunately, he almost totally neglected his own family after independence. At the beginning, he was very attentive, but after independence, he had no time for his family and he left uh, the entire job uh, to Maria. So that was uh, another mismatch. Uh, a third one perhaps that might be, may be of more interest to this audience is that Nyerere was a socialist, an African socialist. He said he was born a socialist. socialist didn't just, socialism didn't just come to him. He was actually born a socialist. But uh, he could not, he, didn't, he never saw eye to eye with Marxists, okay? So he, he always had these slanging matches with uh, the intellectuals, the Marxist intellectuals, particularly the University of Islam, and he railed against them for what he thought was their uh, uh, parroting Marxist uh, jargon, 
without actually understanding what it meant and not attempting at all to contextualize it for Tanzania and, uh, and uh, Africa. So that was another mismatch, very strong mismatch, which uh, 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 carried out uh, throughout uh, his life. So ultimately, this teacher, this uh, scholar, this poet, this president, this international figure, statesman, this Pan-Africanist who traveled the world and met all sorts of uh, uh, world uh, leaders all over the world. Uh, at the end of the day, when he was back home in his village at Butiama, he would sit under this little shed with uh, his fellow villagers and play this the game of bow with them and have a meal with them and exchange banter with them. And then in the morning, he would take his home, his head home and walk to his farm and uh, tend uh, his maize or his legumes or whatever it was he was growing at that time. And that was his regular practice. So that's Nyerere, an extraordinary man who was uh, completely ordinary. Thank you. Thank you, Saida. Very, very interesting. I, I love the tales. Wish we could continue further. We'd be honored if you stay with us for the entire duration. And may I, in that order, have the privilege of inviting Dr. Nagwanza Kamata. Dr. Kamata, are you, uh, if you could unmute yourself, I see you are muted. If you could unmute yourself and take us through what you consider the key interesting points of volume two. Thank you, Sandeep. And thank you, everybody. And um, I would like to join Saida to thank the organizer of this uh, dialogue and for giving us an opportunity for a first launch of our, our, our book. Uh, Saida have already explained uh, how we wrote this book. And I was uh, leading a lead author of volume two or book two. That's how we call them book one, book two, and book three. And book three is becoming a nationalist. And basically, book two, uh, and as Saida said, we were writing about Nyerere, but through him, we are telling the story of the country. And uh, I think Isa will, uh, and Saida will remember that we also wanted to tell it, not only the story of, of the country, but the story of Africa and the South through Mwalimu's involvement in all these uh, countries and, and regions. Uh, becoming a nationalist basically covers a period from his formative stage as a nationalist, uh, basically his political his political life up to when Tanganyika becomes independent, gains its independence in 1962. And so book two starts with Nyerere's early political formation and becoming a nationalist, his involvement in the formation of the nationalist uh, movement, which called Tanganyika African National Union, TANU, and then his uh, not only formation of, of, of TANU, but also encountering the various problems of organizing his people to fight for independence and the difficulties that uh, they encountered in the process of demanding for independence of, of the country. Uh, then there is a, an aspect of the independence period because Everybody was fighting for independence without even thinking much of what will come after independence. And so the book uh, tries to uh, establish the kind of problems that they encountered during the, the, the independent period. Most of them are common uh, with other uh, countries in Africa, but basically what was to be expected after independence? There were so many expectations from the, the masses, the workers, the peasants and uh, the elite, the, the, the emerging petty bourgeoisie in, 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 in the 
country and the expectations of independence, what will independence bring about? And so after independence, and Nyerere and his party and his colleagues encounter a lot of problems and they have to manage expectations after, after independence and managing uh, expectations involved also suppressing uh, very uh, brutally some of the expectations. For example, workers were demanding uh, pay rise, better working conditions, only to realize that uh, the, the coffers of the state they inherited didn't match with the expectations the people had. And that is the challenge of independence and the expectations people had during uh, that period. But immediately, or oh, when Tanganyika became independent, there were some serious debates which emerged in terms of defining what is the future of the country, what kind of country are we going to have? And one of the things that I would like to point out was the question of citizenship. I think this was an important debate in Tanganyika just immediately after independence. Who was going to be a Tanganyikan? And Tanganyikan uh, citizenship would be based on what principles? There were those who thought that Tanganyika citizenship should be based on, on, on race, and citizens will only be uh, people, black, uh, 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 Africans, and some defined Africans as black people with black skin. And Nyerere was opposed to that, and there was a very serious debate in the uh, book tries to uh, touch on that and see how that debate uh, happened and how it was resolved. And the way it was resolved established a very important principle in Tanzania on how citizenship are defined. They are not defined on the basis of color, they are defined on the basis of their choice of making the country their home. But there is another uh, incidence which is of importance uh, for, uh, for in, in, and is touched in this book, and this is about the struggle for powers after independence. I have already mentioned the challenge, uh, the expectations different groups, different classes had to independence. And one of the group, an organized group, was the army. And the army after independence was a colonial army. Uh, Tanganyika inherited a state, a colonial state, and its instruments, including the army, and those instru uh, institutions, the instruments of the state were not decolonized. And one of the, uh, the institution which was not decolonized was the army. They also had the expectations. Uh, they wanted better pay, they wanted uh, better living conditions, they wanted decolonization of uh, of privileges because there were uh, discriminations and different treatments of black soldiers and uh, British soldiers. So there were all, all those kind of things. And 1964, in January, the army mutinied. And Nyerere had to invite the British to crush the mutiny and to disarm the, 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 the soldiers who had mutinied. And Nyerere called that a day of disgrace because it was disgraceful for a country which has just uh, attained its independence and um, calling back those who colonized you to deal with the problems which uh, you encounter immediately after independence. So it, the book, discusses that uh, at length on what happened and how the the problem was resolved. But in the end, and I would like to mention this because it's an important thing, that the army was resolved, uh, what, the, the army was dissolved, and a new uh, nationalist army was uh, formed out from the scratch, and that became uh, an, an important instrument in the liberation struggle in Africa. So, and finally, the book discusses the unity between Tanganyika and Zanzibar, which happened some months after the mid, it, it happened some, a few, a few, a few days after, after the mutiny, and Tanganyika and Zanzibar formed the union. And, but it also continues to discuss some of the problems and challenges 
that the union experienced at the early formation of it and which have continued to experience many years later because mono, most of these problems were not resolved at the time. So basically that's what the book uh, says and tries to, uh, some of the aspects the book touches on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamata. I also sincerely hope you will stay with us. A big round of applause for what you just shared, a virtual applause. Several questions are ringing in my head, even as you were talking about that interesting time. How did the Tanzanian struggle inform and inspire other struggles across the continent and beyond? What happened to the power contestations and how does it inform the new wave of nationalisms that we see today, the regressive ones often? So lots of issues there, which probably I'll encourage people who are joined us today. If you have questions, please put it in the question answer box. You can see it in the right bottom side. If you're on the Zoom chat, if you're on the Facebook, you can type it in response to the live event. Uh, I once again thank you and hope you're staying here with us. It'd be great. And take this opportunity at the same time to invite Professor Shivji. For those who have just joined us, Professor Shivji, Isa Shivji, noted Marxist thinker, academic, activist, pan-Africanist, and an inspirator to many across the continent, is here with us today. Uh, Professor Shivji will first reflect on the volume three of the new biography of Nairere, Development as Rebellion, and thereafter seamlessly continue to deliver the key talk of the day, the pitfalls of nationalism. Uh, without much further ado, and with a warm welcome, Professor Shivji, I invite you to deliver your reflections on the book, and thereafter, on a related subject, continue on to the question of nationalism. Thank you, Professor Shivji. You have to unmute yourself and please take the stage. Thank you very much, Sandeep. And my sincere thanks to my co-authors who laid the ground. So really, they have made my work much easier. As you said, in reflecting on volume three or book three, actually, I would be uh, uh, talking of, of, the, of, the, of the various aspects of the pit force of nationalism, which is what is going to be my presentation. Very briefly, at the time of independence, Tangan Nika did not inherit a nation. And, and, and Nyerere said this in explicit terms. What it inherited was a, a geographical space bounded by the colonially drawn uh, boundaries. So Nyerere's first task, and he said that to the United Nations, even before independence, was to build a nation out of a collection of ethnic, ethnic groups. And that remained his his primary task, the nation building. So national building project became <laughs> almost his obsession. Okay. And uh, that actually runs through like red thread in, in, in book three. And around this project of nation building, uh, what I would call dilemmas, dilemmas I would call uh, 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 contradictions. These are a set of contradictions revolved around that project of building the nation. First question arises is what would be the agency of the building the nation? The party? Well, there was no party. As, 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 as Kamat has explained, uh, Tanu was an independence movement composed of diverse petty bourgeois groups. A sole purpose was to get independence. It is united around the goal of independence. But it did not have a program. It did not have a, a, even a vision of what happens after, after independence. Because different groups have different interests in what they expected of, of independence. So the party itself had to be built. So party could not possibly be the agency for building the nation. 
the only agents available to Nyerere to build the nation was a colonial state, which he inherited. Now, this is a contradiction in terms to use the colonial state to build a nation. The colonial state, by definition, was, of course, not a contradiction to, to, to nation. But here was the state that he had to use to build the nation. The state, it had to be transformed for it to be a nation, national state. And as Kamat has pointed out, the mutating gave him a jolt and began to think of this process of transforming the state. But the fact remained that the state was the agency to build the nation, which of course had its own problems and which resulted in the contradiction, some of which were, I'm, going to, I'm going to point out. Now, Yarere's imagery of the nation was Western, essentially Western. And he said so very openly. He said, what other possibility he had? The nation state he wanted to build, of course, is the nation state which was built by the Western countries. And what alter did he have except to build the nation state? So in effect, in practice, the building of the nation reduced itself to building the nation national state, in fact, building the state. So nation building became state building. And he really made no apologies about it because what else could he do, he said, except build the state so as to keep the nation together and to guide the nation. Now, having introduced my, 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 my topic, I grouped his dilemmas or contradictions around four to five clusters. One, national unity against freedom. Two, university versus diversity. Three, equality versus equity. Four, nation versus class. And fifth, pan-Africanism versus territorial nationalism. These were Yerel's dilemmas. Now I'll take one after another. Nation building entailed national unity. You could not possibly allow centripetal forces to disrupt your nation building project. So this was his first dilemma. How to build a nation without allowing the freedoms, individual freedoms, collective freedoms, like for example, freedom of association. Because if you allow these freedoms, they could result in disrupting your nation building teaching project. So what had to be curtailed? Individual freedoms as well as uh, collective freedoms. For the state to establish its hegemony, which resulted in a highly centralized bureaucratic state with organizational hegemony. And very quickly, it reigned in on the opposition and other centripetal forces which Yerere feared. So he ended up with a one-party system. Now, he always made it clear, and I think he was sincere about it, that a one-party system for him was not a philosophical position. It was really a pragmatic position because, as I already said, you could not possibly allow other parties which would divert you from the project of uh, building, building your nation. So whenever uh, other, 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 other groups arose, he suppressed them. And that takes me to the second cluster of contradictions or dilemmas. Unity versus diversity. And when I say diversity, I mean ethnic, cultural, religious, and political diversities. Here I could and did countenance ethnic, cultural, religious diversity. So long as these were not politicized so long as they did not take an obvious political form of opposition, and so long as they did not threaten his national building project. If he perceived that any of these diversities, under the name of diversity, tended towards taking a political form, he would come down forcefully against them and even suppress it. We have narrated in detail in book three 
the saga of East African Muslim Welfare Society, which was a body of Muslims and which eventually was attempted by some politicians to become the political organizational home of political of politicians. And he came down against, against it very strongly under the rubric of his secular politics. This we'll discuss in detail in book three, so I leave it to you to, 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 to read it. But I think he summed up his position on the question of diversity as follows. I remember after he stepped down in one of the international conferences, a mysterious young man asked him, Malimu, why are you so much against our ethnic diversity? You yourself, after this conference, would go back to your village, have pombe, means uh, liquor, with your fellow Waze of Zanaki. Zanaki was the tribe from which he came. And then you are so much against this diversity. So Walimo told him, yes, that is true. Culturally, I'm in Zanaki, but politically, I'm a Tanzanian. I would never allow anyone to persuade me to vote for X, Y, or Z because he is or she is my fellow Zanaki. Now that sums up his position, not to criticize uh, 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 these diversities including, of course, religion. The third cluster of contradictions is around the question of equality versus equity. Nyerere inherited a very unequal society, which was a colonial society. And this inequality ran along racial lines. It was almost a hierarchy of races, white, Asians, and Africans. And whites, and nations were privileged minorities. Not only they were privileged, being given certain favors and so on, but also economically they were privileged and therefore they were economically well endowed. Now this is the what inherited. And yet throughout the book, the philosophy that runs through Nyerere's thinking, about which he was very consistent, by the way, is the philosophy of equality of all human beings. And for him, equality of all human beings meant equality of human dignity. Every human being is equal in his or her dignity. This was not the notion of bourgeois equality before law or a notion of equality of opportunity. No, it was equality because of the humanness of every human human being. And he was very strong on that. Now here he is first with the situation where there is this inequality based on race. How do you address the historical inequalities? How do you address them? And how do you redress them? Without also you becoming unequal or discriminatory. And Kamat has pointed out that this gave rise to very vociferous debate on the question of citizenship, whether the immigrant community should be given citizenship, it became also a big issue on the question of Africanization of the public, public service. And in fact, the question of Africanization was one of the motives behind the army mutiny, which Kamata has touched on. So it was a very tough situation for Yarere. Yet to recognize that equality cannot be, equality among unequals is inequitable. So how does he address inequality, which is inequitable without taking affirmative action without discrimination. And these are the kind of debates that partly led to his resignation as prime minister in 1961-62 and go back to the party to reorganize it. Yerere, to his credit, accepted that there were historical inequalities along racial lines. And this could prove to be very explosive. They had to be addressed. But he had a different view of how to address them. Eventually, this dilemma or set of contradictions resulted in the adoption of the Arusha Declaration, Tanzania's blueprint for socialism and self-reliance. One of the important measures of the Arusha Declaration was to nationalize um, leading means of production, which were now in the hands of the state, 
So you had state ownership, but which in turn created an almost uh, 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 doubled the bureaucracy, the state and the parastatal bureaucracy. So what was a bureaucratic caste now began to develop its own interests, causing danger of the rise, the possible rise of a new class, a kind of state bourgeoisie, or what we in our debates call a bureaucratic bourgeoisie. But he refused to recognize this. For him, Arusha Declaration was essentially a nationalist document. It was essentially a cement to keep the nation together. And he would not allow any talk of class and class struggle to disrupt his nation building project or against his nationalist ideology. And uh, Sayyid pointed this out that in this regard, he came down strongly against the university community, which used to talk about classes and classic at this time. That brings me to the next set of contradiction around the question of nation and class. What do you privilege? The nation or class? Or does this development or this struggle happen in stages, as many national liberation movements argued, the first national liberation and then later social emancipation. This has been actually not, it was not simply the dilemma of Yarere, although he did not put it in those terms. It is the dilemma of the left, including Marxists, and national liberation leaders everywhere. But uh, whereas others agonized over it, people like uh, Amikal Cabral, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Chris Hani, where the echo agonized over it, for Yarere, it was very clear from the outset. Nation takes precedence. And he used to say, I am a Tanzanian first, and only secondly, a, a, a socialist. And once you privilege the nation, of course you privilege national unity and therefore suppress any other diversity as I already mentioned. The result was that the whole nation building project and even the Arusha Declaration, implementation of the Declaration, became a top-down process, essentially led by the state and therefore by the state bureaucracy. Although the Arusha Declaration said that the country was of workers and peasants. And although the beneficiaries of the Russian declaration were workers and peasants, but peasants and workers and peasants were not the drivers of the process, drivers of the bureaucracy. Undoubtedly, the process was not simple or linear, as we've explained in book three. There were struggles. There was opposition to the bureaucracy, to the rising bureaucracy. Workers' struggle, which have been described in Book 3, peasant struggles, student struggles. But Yerede came out against them and suppressed them. He suppressed their organizational form and they suppressed those struggles by further centralizing the state and centralizing the party itself. He many times said, that he was trying to build socialism without socialists. And the development essentially meant rebellion against the status quo. From that, you get the title of the biography, Development as Rebellion. Yet when the rebels did arise in his own backyard, he suppressed them. He failed to see them as his allies. He failed to let the potential socialists develop from the struggles of the people. Regardless of that, I think the left, the progressive community, has a lot to learn from Walimu Nyerere. What is fascinating about Nyerere, and I hope people will read this 
in book three is that even in his mistakes, he continued to teach the great volume that he was. So for the progressive community, I think Yerena's example is a great teacher. Those who drum up all the time, and this happened particularly after Yerena's Yere stepped out of power, and it has continued to some extent. Those who, who, who drum up the failure of Yerez's project, in my view, do not understand the concrete situation, nor the struggles that went into, went on in the country, both within the country, what I, we have called class struggle, and against imperialist interests. And these have been described in great detail, great detail in our biography. The biography consciously refused to either demonize or eulogize Nyerere. Instead, as Saida said, he wanted to situate Nyerere's story in the history of the country. And by talking about Nyerere, we attempted to also talk about uh, the more recent political history of the country. I hope you succeeded in that. We will see how the readers react. Ours, therefore, is a biography of Yarere and the political history of the, the country. Another set of contradictions or dilemmas I may quickly mention is around territorial nationalism against Pan-Africanism. And, and Yarere recognized this very early in his political life. In 1966, he gave a fascinating address to the University of Zambia called the dilemma of a Pan-Africanist. And that was his dilemma. Here as the head of state, he had to build a nation, the Tanganyika nation, which meant that it was taking away the country further away from the Pan-Africanist goal. So how do you resolve that dilemma? The more you build nationalism within the country, the less likely the prospect of, of building Pan-Africanism. So I will not say more about that because we are going to deal with this in, in, in book four. I hope really that we'll eventually be able to uh, write this. It is in preparation. Uh, now I will just not say any more on that. Let me try to wind up some of the things. Did Yerere succeed in building the nation? I would say both yes and no. Yes, because Yerere went furthest compared to many other African countries. And no, because he did not build a durable nation. So when the neoliberal onslaught came, the nation began to show cracks. And none other than Yerere himself recognized in 1994 in a speech that the national edifice that we are trying to build is showing cracks. And unless you guys fill those cracks, this nation can easily disintegrate. And he pointed out some of the, some of the uh, cracks. Uh, quickly, one on the question of union between Zanzibar and Tanganyika, because there was a lot of talk about secession at the time. Two, no respect for the constitution, running the country without following the constitution. In fact, in another speech, he said that if you guys close your eyes to the breaches of the constitution, you end up with a dictator. Three, running the country without regard to law, without following rule of law. Fourth, corruption. And fifth, politicization of ethnic and religious identity. In my view, since his speech, I think the cracks have widened. Now, many of you would recognize in the title, the pitfalls of nationalism, which is a modification of Fanon's chapter four title, I believe, the pitfalls of national consciousness. Fanon point, points out in a very eloquent form, the limits of what he called the national bourgeoisie or the national middle class to build an independent anti-imperialist nation. 
He may have exaggerated in caricaturing that class, but I think he was exaggerating the truth. And by and large, I think he has been proved right. This class, in my view, is incapable of building an independent anti-imperialist nation, and it has proved so. So the task of both national liberation and social emancipation falls on the working people. But now, all over the world, we are witnessing the rise of narrow reactionary nationalism, both in the global north, particularly in the global Atlantic north and the global south. Some of these reactionary nationalisms actually border on neo-fascism, exhibiting what the other called cracks in the national edifice, particularly for Africa. I believe the high point of nationalism was the anti-colonial movement, but it has exhausted itself. In my view, and I'll be a little more provocative, in my view, nationalist ideology, nationalism has exhausted itself. And we need to, particularly the left, need to revisit the whole ideology of nationalism. Now we are witnessing a backlash to, 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 to ravages of neoliberalism. And we are witnessing an upsurge of the language of nationalism, which is reactionary, based on religion, ethnic, race, etc. I think the progressives on the left need to be wary of this language of nationalism. We have to distance ourselves from it. And we have to reconstruct ideologies of liberation and emancipation. At least in Africa, we can say at the minimum, it seems to me Pan-Africanism holds the potential for it, which has to be thoroughly anti-imperialist and taking, taking a clear class stand based on the outlook of the working people. The rest will depend on cocky conditions and actual struggles. I, we, we can, one cannot have a blueprint of it. And I'm saying that in doing this, in trying to revisit and reconstruct the whole ideologies of uh, liberation and emancipation, we have a lot to learn from Yerere. His project was remarkable. His project was remarkable. And he was a remarkable man. And he has a lot to teach. And what I've summarized as the contradiction dilemmas actually preg are pregnant with many of the things that we are facing now. And if we revisit this, and many of the things that he discussed are resurfacing. For, uh, 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 resurfacing in, a, in, a, in a even, even more reactionary, reactionary forms. Uh, that is where I will end. I hope I'm not going beyond my time. Thank you, Sandeep. Mr. So would, you, would you say, would you have something more to say on the question of pitfalls of uh, beyond this, what you've mentioned, pitfalls of nationalism? Or should I open it up for the discussant? I think, I think that's open for discussion, so you, you get the feedback on it. But the pitfalls of nationalism, as I already summarized, is yes, basically... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So may I therefore thank you, Professor, uh, and I'll open it up actually, but before opening it up for a discussion and debate, let me first invite Professor Zotzi Sikata. Professor Zotzi, if you could unmute uh, yourself, are you, are you here at the moment? Yes, indeed. I hope you can hear me. Research scholar and professor at the University of Ghana, Institute of African Studies. Honored to have you, Professor, with us today. Prof, uh, just to widen up the question and answers and you offer your own reflections to this wonderful and thought-provoking, Isa ended on a note whether nationalism had exhausted itself and, and whether we kind of uh, need to sort of debate uh, what happens with the kind of nativism that we see arising all over. We would love to hear your reflections on Professor Shivji's talk, building on his experiences with Nairere's nationalism and the frustration Nairere expressed in the later years. He mentioned 1984, but years around those on the cracks question. But beyond that as well on what he saw as the key pitfalls of this wave of nationalism. Over to you, Professor Sikata. We have about 15 minutes, if that's okay with you. It is very much okay with me. Thank you very much, Sandeep. And thank you all for uh, joining us to uh, discuss 
this very important topic. First of all, I want to congratulate Professor Isa Shivji, Professor Saida Yaya Othman, and Dr. Ngwanza Kamata for their monumental efforts to document the life and times of Mwalimu Julius Nyerere. Although I've not had the benefit of reading these uh, three volumes, I've had the benefit of reading uh, quite a bit of what um, Mwalimu Shivji has been writing all these years about nationalism. So I believe that um, that together with the three presentations allows me to say a few things about um, the, the book and also about the pitfalls of nationalism. I especially like the title of the book, The Idea of Development as Rebellion. I think um, in there is a sense of development as an integral aspect of the struggle for self-determination. And it's a welcome departure from the now formulaic meaning of development, which as we all know is a subject of great skepticism and, and justifiably um, so. And I think it's entirely appropriate that we discuss the pitfalls of nationalism at this time in historical perspective. And I agree with uh, the, the authors that Mwalimu Nyerere's life is actually a study in a certain form of nationalism, what some people have called polycentric nationalism, which is very far from the ethnocentric, jingoistic, and exclusionary variant which is on the ascendancy across the world. So while the situation in the US, the United Kingdom, India, Brazil, and Myanmar show very clearly the dangers of ethnocentric and racist nationalism, there are many more examples of the growing popularity of ethnocentric nationalist politics across the globe. And much of it is in response to the crisis of neoliberal globalization and capitalism. The thuggery and irrationality in some of the responses to the COVID-19 pa pandemic such as the interception and monopolization of PPEs and medication, the race to corner the supplies of vaccines in development and the attacks on the WHO are all examples of this nationalism, which has given all nationalisms a terrible reputation. I think it's important that we rescue nationalism from the clutches of ethnocentric nationalism, even as we study its pitfalls and address its limitations in our praxis as progressive scholars and activists. I think it also raises a question about how to be nationalist and at the same time be a committed Pan-Africanist and internationalist and even more critically, a socialist and a feminist. Professor Shifty's discussion today is important in that regard. He raised many questions that we must continue to deliberate upon. The five dilemmas facing Nyerere he raised are particularly telling and important for thinking about nationalism even today. And, and, and I thank him for raising and expatiating on these, the questions of nation building, how to manage unity and ethnic and religious diversity, the questions of equality and equity, nation versus class, territorial nationalism versus pan-Africanism. The question I wanted to ask is that on hindsight and in thinking today, are all these contradictions do they have to be contradictions? I think it's an open question. And it raises questions about the hierarchies of interest in our practice. And the fact that we are learning to understand that um, contradictions and hierarchies are interlocking and need to be treated with, with equal importance. Perhaps from my vantage point as a, a socialist and a feminist, I, I strongly believe in, in paying a lot more attention to these hierarchies that we have constructed over the years and, and looking at the fact that they have not been working for us. Secondly, I, be, I completely agree with Professor Shivji when he says that we need to revisit nationalism. But I don't think it's only nationalism we need to revisit. And although he poses Pan-Africanism as um, a, a better approach, I'd like to say that we need to revisit our Pan-Africanism as well given all its variants, all the contradictions, the fact that currently the movement is paralyzed because of, of some of these uh, uh, divisions. I want to uh, then raise about three matters for your, for, for, uh, your consideration for Shivji go, uh, going forward. The first one is whether nationalism is still salient in this age of globalization. And if so, which variants we should be interested in? 
or whether nationalism is incompatible with Pan-Africanism and internationalism. I heard you when you said that Pan-Africanism, uh, uh, nationalisms have run their course and that we, we need to look, we need to think again about how we prosecute our struggle for self-determination and, 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 and also against imperialism. Um, some uh, scholars, many scholars agree with you and they've argued that in the struggle against neoliberalism and imperialism and in the struggle to create more equal and just societies, nationalism may have no place. Others, however, have argued that what we need is a polycentric nationalism, one that sees the nation as an imagined community, but nevertheless closely tied with the identity of citizens. And others have also pointed out that even if we do not like nationalist discourse, it remains resilient as a discourse and an organizing principle. So it's worth paying attention to. I think these are important points, points we should note. And those that have argued that polycentric nationalism um, is, 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 is an alternative to the ethnocentric nationalism we see today have noted that Polycentric nationalism see the nation as just one among many. They see the nation as multi-ethnic, multicultural, and in some cases, multiracial. They do not see it as a superior exclusive one. And in that sense, um, people have distinguished different nationalisms. So McClintock, for example, has distinguished Africana nationalism from the nationalism, nationalism of the liberation movements in Africa and their struggle for self-determination. I, reading, reading um, the discussions of polycentric nationalism, I would argue that it's actually not incompatible with Pan-Africanism and internationalism. And I think Kwame Nkrumah's nationalism is an iconic example of the kind of polycentric nationalism that is needed in the, in the world today. And the task of that kind of nationalism are twofold. It is both to defeat imperialism and achieve self-determination, while at the same time addressing the internal class, gender, and ethnic contradictions within the nation. And from your, 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 your exposition about Nyerere's struggles, I think it's the failure to deal with the internal contradictions that has been a huge challenge to the legitimacy of polycentric nationalism. And uh, Mualimu's uh, struggles with the students, the public officials, and even the Arusha Declaration and the Mongozo, I think are heroic if doomed that efforts to pay attention to internal contradictions. And chief among them being the use of the state for private accumulation. And since this remains uh, an abiding problem and bedevils many African states, I think it's, it's important to, to, to pay attention to, 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 to this issue. The second matter I want to raise is the contradictory relationship between nationalism and modernization theories at the heart of, of development. And related to this, therefore, the role of the nation state in structural transformation. And your, from, your, from your presentations, you pointed out that um, a top-down approach to development has been the hallmark of Nyerere's politics. I would venture to say that this is common to a whole generation of nationalist leaders. And it is also linked with the embrace of modernity and the notion of rural people as, as, as backward, which is a contradiction in a movement which is about self-determination. In the case of Nkuma and, and, and Nehru, it's resulted in the embrace of large-scale um, um, And Nehru, if I remember, called um, dams the temples of modern India. In Nkuma's case, it's also resulted in the embrace of large-scale tractor-driven agriculture on state farms, the neglect of the land question and the peasantry's place in the nation. Since then, there has been a marked deterioration in the quality of the nationalisms that we knew in the early post-independent period. And Tandika and Kandawere has drawn attention to the, nationalist, the nationalism of a cohort of leaders who in some ways are post-nationalist in the orientation. And these leaders are very much detached from Pan-African ideals, the Konambedies, the Chilubes, more recently, Museveni, Kagami, Afewaki, Melech, Zenawi, and so on. The kinds of nationalists you might call the structural adjustments nationalists. This raises the question of how nationalism should see the question of development and structural transformation and the role of the state in this 
conjunction. I very much would like to hear what you, you think about it. The third issue I want to raise has to do with the contradictions between feminisms and nationalisms. All nationalisms are gendered and all are invented and all are dangerous, says McClintock. Um, I think this statement is linked with the fact that there's no variant of nationalism, whether ethnocentric or polycentric, which has granted women and men the same privileged access to the resources of the nation state. And many nationalisms have actually depended on a very powerful construction of gender difference and ignored the questions of, of, of power. And therefore, women have found themselves as bearers of a nation while lacking nationality of, of, of their own. A number of scholars have drawn attention to different ways in which women have been related to the nation. And I just want to mention five of them. One is as biological reproducers, as symbols and signifiers of national difference. Two, as transmitters and producers of cultural narratives of the nation. Three, as reproducers of the boundaries of the nation through which groups of men they are allowed to have sexual intercourse or bear children with. And lastly, as active participants in, in national movements and in the public life of, of nations. In spite of this inauspicious relationship between women, feminists, women and, 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 and the nationalist project, feminists have played an active role in nationalist struggles across the developing world. And this is high, uh, highly documented by, by many scholars and, and it's something that we should, we should pay attention to. It is clear from these accounts that they have tried to change andro the androcentric character of nationalism, but without success. And interestingly, several nationalist leaders in Africa wrote about the imperatives of a more gender equal society and the key roles of women in the struggle. So Cabral um, wrote most eloquently about the role of women in the struggle. Samora Marshall did the same, Kwame Nkrumah, and, and today I'm hearing that Nyerere also had things to say about uh, women and, 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 and nationalism. In spite of the lack of transformation in the character of nationalism's androcentric biases, um, scholars such as Ranju here have argued that in spite of the troubles, a polycentric nationalism, if reformed, can offer much to feminist struggles. And I wanted to ask, what exactly could a polycentric nationalist offer feminisms today and what could feminisms offer polycentric uh, uh, nationalisms? My last point has to do with nationalism and, and the question of democratic politics today. Um, I want to raise just a small aspect of this because this is a large uh, topic. I want to focus on the fact that nationalism affected conceptions of the university and what intellectuals and what scholarship should be about. And I believe that these issues were raised by all three speakers when they talked about Nyerere's relationship with the, with the universities. Kwame Nkrumah had a very troubled relationship with the University of Ghana and as, as well. And Kodesha and other Pan-African institutions have been concerned with this issue for, for decades. We see now that one of the things happening with ethnocentric nationalism has been an attack on progressive scholars and the neoliberalization of higher education. And scholars in, in our, our comrades in, in various universities around the, 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 the globe have been raising this question about the endangerment of progressive scholars and, 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 and the, the breach of academic freedom and, and the repression that progressive universities are, are suffering. I would uh, be grateful if you could reflect a bit on, on, um, on this topic and, and the way forward for thinking about uh, nationalism and democratic politics today. So I, I'd like to stop here, but to thank you for a very engaging all of you for a very engaging introduction to this book. I can't wait to raise my to lay my hands on the three volumes and, and, and begin to dig into it. I've learned a lot just listening to the expositions in the book today. And I thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sikata. You speak for me in thanking the speakers and Professor Shivji for the issues raised. Friends and participants, you're most welcome to type your questions in the chat box or the question answer box. 
Uh, you raised, Rodzi, some of the issues uh, for Professor Shivji and other colleagues to reflect on. Uh, and uh, it's noted, a few questions that I noted and more questions are coming to the panelists. And I'll open the floor for a question and answer session for the next 45, 50 minutes that we have. So I encourage questions, I encourage clarifications from all who are present here today. And I encourage debates and points of view that you may have here today on this very, very crucial and pertinent and the current question of nationalism. Uh, Professor Shivji, I noticed a few questions uh, which have been in the chat box for you. And one of those questions uh, deals with the question of uh, what should the popular classes do at this stage when they seemed abandoned? Uh, not just from the project of nationalism or, or, or their space within this project, uh, but when they face uh, waves of chauvinism. I saw Irungu pointing, Irungu Houghton is here, he is pointing to that, that dimension. I also saw a question from Srai Nele, if I'm pronouncing the name right. Uh, what, is, what is possible for the left to do in Tanzania and in Africa for a reinvention? Of, of the dreams which probably have not been abandoned. Uh, so these two questions uh, for, for Professor Sivji. For Saida, an interesting question, since you talked of Bride Price and Maria and Nairere, an interesting anecdotal question, did Nairere actually, what, what happened with the daughters of, of Nairere? So was the question of bride price uh, brought up then uh, is, is, a, is a point uh, made to you. Uh, more questions are coming uh, such as for any of the speakers, such as of the role of diaspora on the advancing, on advancing the Pan-Africanist sentiment and uh, Pan-Africanist advances. Uh, the question of land in, in the modern day uh, nations, um, nation project, a uh, national project. Uh, some of the questions coming in addition to what uh, Dr. Sikata has already raised. So we'll have the round one with these. I see more questions flowing in rapidly. I'll try and list them. And I also invite some of the speakers who wish to ask those questions. Uh, so Professor Shivji, back over to you for the first round of responses. Uh, and to, uh, to the other speakers, Dr. Kamata and Dr. Saida, if you're there for your responses and reflections. Uh, I, I think if I understood you correctly, the first question is what should popular classes do at this conjuncture? Is it right? Can you hear me? Yes, to organize themselves at this conjecture. Yes, yes. I, I think that, that, that is really an important question. And that is precise the question. If I were to give a short answer, organize. And I see, this is what <laughs> our comrade used to say, the pan Africanist comrade, organize. Now, the more critical question is, what about the petty bourgeois left? Many of us actually have this background. What is our role in that? And I think it is easily said then, but our role is to articulate the struggles of the people. People are struggling. Okay? People are organizing in their own ways. So there are pockets of resistance, pockets of organization. But how do you coordinate and bring together these pockets? And that's a major question. What organizational form can it take? Okay, there was a time when we had a classical answer, party. Okay, but I don't think that that is no longer totally acceptable. What kind of party? Okay, another answer recently more has been movements, social movements, but they also have shown great diversity and contradiction with themselves. Can we talk about a real emancipatory organization without being led by an emancipatory ideology? And here comes to mind the famous dictum of Amikai Cabral. He said, I have seen many revolutions, 
but I yet to see a successful revolution without revolutionary ideology. And this is where I think Georgi also mentioned that we have to revisit the whole question of ideology, reconstruct them. And I argued that, of course, one of the important elements, at least in Africa, would be Pan-Africanism. Of course, Pan-Africanism itself needs to, be, needs to be revisited because it had its own, its own problems. Okay. So I think that is where I'll end, but I want to say something in the same regard about what Georgi was raising on the question of, uh, 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 um, yeah, she, she pointed out the whole question of this, this, this obsession, and understandably so, during the early nationalist period with large scale development, both in rural areas as well as as well as industrial and so on and so forth. I think I think that is true. But interestingly enough, in the case of Mali Munyarere, okay, he did believe in at some point small is beautiful, okay, in form of Ujama villages. And yet, of course, he allowed large state farms as well. I think with the hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight of 50 years, we are coming back and we have been discussing this in our Algerian school, the whole question of small producers and small peasant production in the importance of it. From what your point of view, you look at it. And once you do that, you are immediately raising the question of feminism, because who is the peasant, who is the large who is the president in the country, right? Now, much of Africa, it's a woman. Nyerere has said this very often. So one point of departure from Nyerere, which of course I could not discuss, but it is the book, was the way these villages were organized. In other words, a kind of self-determination democracy at the village level. Of course, the bureaucracy never respected it and they suppressed it. But the structure still exists. But today, in fact, we are going back to the centralization. So when it comes to local governments, village governments, we are going back to centralization. The other question is what is it possible for the left to do in Tanzania and elsewhere? Well, what is possible is we have a concrete answer. What is available? What are circumstances? What is that you can do? Someone also raised the question of whole question of democracy, which again, in my view, is extremely important. But that too, we have to revisit. Because there's a tendency, when you talk about democracy, we fall back on liberal democracy. And Sabir Amin has written quite a bit on that. I am not, not want to dismiss totally the struggle for constitutionalism, the struggle for human rights and so on. But at the same time, I, it is important for the progressive left to recognize the limits of these struggles so long as they are not joined with the daily life, day-to-day -day struggles of the people themselves, or the working people. And I think that is a big task we are, we are facing. How do you connect with actual struggles of the people? Those of us who try to articulate their interests. What do we learn from them? And how do we articulate that learning? Of course, all these answers are very abstract, obviously because they are concrete questions, and each concrete situation will throw up its own its own possibilities, uh, etc. While we are with you, Professor Shivji, and yes. before I go to the other panelists, uh, Firoz Manji here. Thanks, Firoz, uh, for your question. Uh, Firoz is saying, and he agrees with you, the fact that uh, uh, there was not a popular alternative to the state and a lot of nation building project in those years was essentially state building project. The point Firoz is raising was despite the idea of African socialism, there seems to have been no anti-capitalist strategy. So you could have been anti-imperialist uh, without being anti-capitalist. So how do you sort of reflect on, on, on this issue, Professor Shivji? That is, that is very true. And I think that is another thing, particularly now, among the left circles, there is a whole tendency of anti-imperialism without being anti-capitalist. And this, in my view, as Firoz points out, is, is dangerous because after all, imperialism is just 
an edifice built on, on capitalism. And increasingly, I think we are a conjunction history, and particularly, I think, as I come out with the pandemic, that new forces are beginning to realize uh, the, the limits of capitalism, even of national capitalism, the severe limits. And therefore, the term socialism, which was once a, a term of abuse, is no longer so. Even in a country like US, of what a variant, the very fact that people do talk about socialism, <clears throat> the very fact that they now realize that there are severe limits of the profit making capitalism and how it has affected the health and the well being of the people. So I think we are a very interesting conjecture. While we tend to talk about, and rightly so, the rise of uh, uh, rightist forces, but I think the conditions that are being created offer for the first time for, for the left, for the socialist left, to be audacious, as Samirami would say. We no longer have to hide ourselves behind other levels. Because I think people are increasingly realizing the absolute limits of profit-making capitalism and who makes the profits. Thank you. Uh, I invite Dr. Kamata and Dr. Saida if you have reflections on the questions thus far specifically to you or more generally before we go to round two. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I think on the question of the bride price, uh, we don't have direct uh, information about that, obviously. But if we project uh, what we know about Malimo, I think we can uh, safely say that he would uh, have vehemently opposed it. Malimo had total contempt for money. He didn't handle money everywhere he went. He had no money. He was handed money even when he went to church. He was given the uh, uh, contribution for the church by his assistants. And uh, somehow both Ma, his wife, Maria, and the children also seem to have uh, anticipated, they would ask themselves, what would Malimo have done? And then act accordingly. Because they knew if they had acted otherwise. Although I said earlier that he, he did not pay much attention to uh, his family, but when it came to them uh, sort of going against the principles which he put forward in the Arusha Declaration, and his, he came down on them hard. He had people follow them around to see what they were doing, if they, if they were engaging in uh, activities which did not go according to that. He came down on them very hard. So I don't think, even Maria herself, she, she used to say that uh, her own father, being a Christian, it married only one wife, and he did not uh, 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 emphasize this question of uh, bride price. So my, my feeling is that uh, his daughters probably would, uh, you know, not have <laughs> obtained a bride price. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kamata. Do you have any any reflections at this stage, or should we open up for round two? Okay, we'll go to round two. There are two live questions that we have. I'll invite uh, Dr. Jomo K S and Dr. Akwasi Aidu, uh, if they could be unmuted to ask their question, Joseph. So Dr. Jomo K S, honored to have you here. Uh, if, you're, if you can hear us. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. And uh, first, let me thank the three co-authors for your excellent work. I look forward to uh, looking at the, at the biography of uh, Molimu. Um, I am very much of the same mind as Professor Sikata uh, in emphasizing uh, the, the anti-imperialist uh, thrust of, um, of the, the, the struggles uh, around which uh, uh, African movements and other movements in Asia uh, organize themselves. Uh, the, the big distinction between the third and fourth international, as all of you uh, know very well, uh, is precisely that, that the focus was on the anti-imperialist struggle. Uh, now, the question, of course, is whether or not the anti-imperialist struggle ends uh, with, uh, with the end of colonialism, and I'm sure we all agree that it didn't didn't end there. And much of our efforts have been precisely around this issue. 
Um, I think Professor Shivji is, is very correct in, in raising uh, difficulties of, uh, of, of, of uh, the, the, the post-colonial order, especially when you do not have an organized movement uh, with, a clear, uh, with a clear understanding of what the post-colonial agenda is. But if we look at what is happening in the world today, I'm afraid we have to admit that the only show in town is capitalism. Uh, whatever one might say about, about China or, or Vietnam, for example, uh, they are, uh, they, it is capitalism with Chinese or Vietnamese characteristics. Uh, and and this, this is the problem in which we, uh, we have to deal with. So pursuing and insisting on the anti-capitalist struggle uh, at this point in time, it seems to me, is, is quite premature and, and, and likely to be doomed to failure. Uh, this, I think, is, is the question. Then is that there are varieties of capitalism, and uh, and and what what kinds of things are possible? This is other point, and which I completely agree with Professor Sikata, is on on the whole question of conceding nationalism to the ethno populace. Uh, in different parts of the world, we 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 uh, people who have organized on the basis of ethnicity, on religion. Uh, uh, and so on and so forth. They, they go by different names. In India, it used to be called communalism, uh, and 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 so on and so forth. Uh, but um, I, I I I choose to use the term uh, ethno populist, um, which uh, I think the Sri Lankans uh, invented in the 1980s uh, when there was a very severe communal conflict there. Uh, partly because if we understand eth ethno populism broadly. Uh, not only in terms of an ethnic group, but also in terms of a religious group or any other type of group which identifies itself culturally or regionally and so on and so forth, then we begin to realize that the uh, uh, that, that uh, this kind of narrow, narrow uh, populism uh, of right-wing populism, uh, which is exclusionary, exclusionary uh, is, is a very major problem. And to concede the mantle of nationalism to them, I think would be a very severe mistake on our part. So the question right now is to, uh, one of the main challenge, major challenges, it seems to me, is precisely to, to discredit uh, the, the, uh, these, these people who claim to be nationalists uh, precisely for the narrowness of their, of their visions and to, uh, to return in a sense uh, to, to uh, to, to the anti-imperialist struggle. There are, of course, other issues which uh, and others have raised, which I which I'm very sympathetic with. And it does not mean, for example, that class goes out of the door. But as uh, I think the first first writing of, of uh, Professor Shivji, which influenced me, was on the whole question of the silent class struggle. The, the question of what, you know, that in the transition, in, after independence, uh, there, there continue to be classes and classes are being formed in the whole process of the post-colonial uh, context and uh, what we do in, in relation to that. Some, some uh, compromises and class compromises are, are very necessary. And the question is what, what would constitute a progressive agenda within that kind of a context? Thank you. Thank you, Jomo, and uh, I completely agree with your, your, your question. And before I actually go on to the second live question, uh, I have a related issue here from Mr. Bimal, Bimal Kumar Punyal from Nepal, leading activist there. He's talking also on the question of ethnocentric nationalism and how problematic it is given most context. So his question is, how do you distinguish between nationalist forces and patriotic forces? In the fight against neo-colonial policies, do you see the relevance of progressive patriotic forces? Question. Next, in the fight against new imperialist interests, do you think resistance can be built at, at the national sphere itself or it needs to go beyond? So it's an added uh, dimension to what uh, Jomo raised. Uh, and, and I now turn to Dr. Akwasi. Dr. Akwasi, are you here with us? Dr. Akwasi, yes, I, yes, I'm, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I so hope you if can you would like me. to um, ask your question yeah. before I go back to the panelists. Sure, and I'll try to be very brief. I, uh, first of all, thank you very much. I really enjoy this. It's the best um, 
Zoom meeting I've had in the last six months um, as we enter the Zoom season, as you all know. It's really full of deep hindsight, insight, and foresight. And I hope this will go viral. I have three very brief comments and a question. My first comment is that um, for many of us non-Tanzanians, uh, Walimu Nyerere was a huge attraction for a number of reasons. The first was his anti-apartheid stance, standard and stance. Um, the second was his socialist principles. Uh, the third was that we felt or knew uh, that, or rather felt that he prioritized non-corruption. I will say anti-corruption because I didn't see many anti-corruption uh, steps, but he was not corrupt. And then the fourth is his um, priority on nation building. Of course, uh, he was full of contradictions as well, like virtually all of us, but the contradictions around him were not antagonistic. They were non-antagonistic contradictions, mostly, not all of them, I think. And that was a very good thing. Uh, my question essentially, um, one is um, kind of one and a half questions. So one question is, he and Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah um, in the early 60s um, were not very well aligned. And I just wonder if there are any thoughts from your side on why he and Nkrumah, he much later on traveled to Ghana where he made a speech and acknowledged the fact and said he was sorry he and Nkrumah uh, were not as close as they could have been. So any, any thoughts on that? Also on a final uh, half question is about the relationship between nationalism and pan-Africanism. He had a very famous quote, uh, which I'm sure you know about, when he said, African nationalism is meaningless, dangerous, and anachronistic if it's not at the same time pan-Africanism. And so, um, it will be interesting to hear your thoughts on that as well. Thank you. So allow me to add a few questions, a few more questions which have come in a lot more actually, but allow me to add three more at the moment, unless I have to deal with a range of very interesting issues coming up for discussion. So allow me to add three more at this moment. Uh, the first is from I think from, where is it, uh, from Facebook. So we'll take one uh, one question from Facebook and I see it on my phone. Uh, Mahima Sokhanda is asking this question. Uh, she wants to ask uh, when nationalism takes a reactionary approach and sidelines inclusivity, what do people who don't identify with this stream of thought do? So what action do they take? Uh, then there is this other issue uh, raised by Professor Muna. Man Professor Manu, are you there? Takiwa Manu, uh, let me make the comment she, he or she has made. Uh, this is more of a comment in reaction to Isa's last point about the continued salience of socialism and its embrace even in the U.S., the point you were making about uh, socialism. I believe that there, have, there has been a retreat from socialism among progressives in Africa, often in reaction to the bastardization of socialism that have occurred around Africa and the erstwhile Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, do we have a real crisis here about the alternatives to the failing neoliberal capitalist regimes and how to rethink these alternatives. So this is something I want to put to the panelists. And then from Veeran Vira, Naikar, 
he wants to ask he would like to ask uh, with the emergence of covid 19 instead of the demise of the nationalist discourse uh, we do not in case of some countries or most countries he is pointing to south africa see the emergence of authoritarianism non democratic nationalisms and strong states which are deeply xenophobic unequal and radicalized regressively radicalized spaces the same dynamics uh, can be seen in the global north and in asia how do we balance our critiques of nationalism with the problem of public health and pandemic without the state so that's his question uh, in in the current context of covid i pause here and go back to the panelists uh, to to reflect on the issues that have just been brought up Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Professor Shivji. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I I I would quickly like to respond to Jomo Akwasi and one or two other questions, and then leave it to my co co panelists to 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 deal with others. Uh, first of all, it's very nice to hear Jomo's and Akwasi's voice after a very long time. Uh, John was point about varieties of capitalism. That actually, today to talk about anti-capitalism is a non-starter. I am not quite sure about it. And he gives the example of China and Vietnam. But both in case of China and Vietnam, I would agree with him that in fact, what they are doing is 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 is, is capitalism. But their anti their anti-imperialism and their building of capitalism is. based on the foundation the revolutionary foundations which were established in a socialist stage so such alternatives are available to them which are not easily available to many african countries so invariably if we choose the capitalist path in africa it invariably becomes comparatorial and cannot maintain consistently and the imperialism i think therefore the two situations china vietnam with africa is not is not easily comparable um a quasi is a point about yerer and kuma debate actually yerer himself uh, uh, referred that there is a lot of correspondence between kuma and yerer unfortunately we have not been able to find this correspondence but for the book for we will definitely try to look for it a quasi can help us in that if kuma papers have been deposited somewhere maybe we'll find those letters there and across his uh, reference was 1997 uh, malimo's speech on on 40th independence anniversary of ghana it's a very interesting speech extremely interesting speech and i think between the lines he admitted that in that debate nkrumah was right and he was wrong he admitted that the first generation nationalists had set them as two tasks one of liberation another of unity on the question of liberation they succeeded to the extent that by 1994 south of the last bastion was independent last bastion was independent but the question of unity he did not and he emphasized in very dramatic terms the importance of pan africanism and that also explains the quotation from uh, from yerere that akwasi has referred to which actually uh, we never tired of, of displaying it and it seems to me that the, the profound nature of that quotation comes out with the present nationalism in africa one marked characteristic of the right wing nationalism is that it is devoid of pan africanism is devoid of pan africanism today even even this stuff we come into kind of regional integration project is in deep trouble so the point that molimo was making that african nationalism without a, a pan african is meaningless it's not only meaningless it's actually dangerous because it tends to become extremely reactionary um 
about Manus worry about rethinking alternatives that actually there is a retreat from socialism. This this is true. And I particularly I don't know if I'm being unfair, but particularly the the the, the old guard socialists seem to be really retreating. Not all of them, but some many of them are retreating from socialist project. But at the same time, I think we look around. The young people arise. At least in my country, the whole group of young people who are revisiting socialism as an alternative and in reinventing it in very interesting ways and struggles. So I, 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 I'm not that pessimistic. I'm still, I'm still hopeful. And in this course of struggle, I'm sure we'll be able to construct alter, alternatives. Okay, I think that's where I would like to end. Uh, maybe my my co-panelist said that and come out of my, my call to add something. Okay. So I invite Dr. Sikata, Dr. Saida, and Kamata to have uh, any okay. reflections on the issues arisen. Dr. Kamata. Okay, thank you, Sandeep. I would like to to begin with one issue on the the issue of nationalism, and you're really saying it is a um, an, uh, the word that it's not it's not not meaningful. So there is a political part of it in terms of believing in a greater identity bigger than the nation, and that's Pan-Africanism. But I also think there was a, a pragmatic aspect of it. And you read somewhere near uh, talking about the East African Federation and uh, Tanganyika is about to become independent. And he feels that the nation and whatever the nation is endowed with, of course the nation was not in existence, but if you are talking about a colonial territory and what it had, it was not adequate in addressing uh, issues which later came to be defined that, as development, the quest for development, that a, 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 a colonial territory and the colonial state were not adequate to, for, for the pursuit of a quick development agenda in whatever way it was defined. And this, because Nyerere and Nkrumah believed that, um, and we all believe Africa uh, is endowed with the resources, but these resources are not uh, used for the development of the continent. They are used for the development of those colonized us. So how do you redeem the resources? How do you gain control of the resources for the development of the continent? And so uh, he felt and strongly believed so that in, that it was not enough for a national a ter a colonial territory to deal with that problem. It needed a uh, concerted effort, a collective effort of all African countries. And to, with that, there was an aspect of, of, of independence itself. I think the context within which African countries were regaining their independence was during the Cold War, and they were not sure whether uh, they will be able to exercise their sovereign rights to, to make decisions to chart an independent paths of development. And that's why Nkrumah was talking about African unity. And one of the principles was non-alignment so that these countries within the, that framework of pan-Africanism, they will be more independent, freer to decide uh, which direction of independence they want. So I just wanted to point out uh, on that, but there is a, Another issue which I wanted to, to, to talk about, uh, which uh, uh, Akwasi I do, has, uh, uh, was, has asked, and Issa tried to respond uh, to, to that question on the issue of Nyerere and Nkrumah. I quite agree with what Issa said uh, on, 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 on Nyerere and the speech of 1997 when he was about to, he, he admitted kind of, of that Nkrumah was right. But one thing I think is clear that both of them were committed Pan-Africanist. There is no question about that. The only difference was when to achieve that, uh, how, how, how do you go about it uh, becoming 
a united Africa. And when should that happen? And you're really a gradualist and Kuruma saying, if you don't unite now, we'll never uh, unite. I, I think that was a major difference. But it's why Nyerere and Nkrumah uh, were not aligned uh, in, in, in one sense, but also if you read some of the correspondence, yes, we didn't get many of those. At least we were able to find two mm, correspondence between Nkrumah and, and Nyerere. And Nyerere somewhere admits that they started, I think, corresponding with Nkrumah since 1960. And in 1960, Nyerere wrote a pamphlet uh, which was uh, advocating for the establishment of the East African Federation, of which Nkrumah was opposed. And uh, it's, he was not only opposed, if you read Bas Davidson, for example, book on Nkrumah, uh, he, he says Nkrumah went further to, to meddle into the, 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 the attempt to federate East Africa. Of course, Nkrumah had his argument as to why Federation were not, it was another bacchanization of, of, of Africa. So he was opposed to that. And uh, in one of the correspondence that we were able to read, uh, there were very uh, uh, sharp exchange between the two, but one Nyerele, Nkrumah accusing Nyerele of being a stooge of imperialist. So I would say uh, probably some of the exchange that between them uh, put them in a situation where they were uh, not in, in aligned in the in, in that sense, and uh, I remember uh, if you, you you come across a speech which Nyerere gave in 1965 at, in Accra at the AU meeting, and Kuruma started he, he gave the speech uh, first, and in that speech also he accused Nyerere of being a stogy of imperialist, and the, one of the things he was pointing at, point he pointed out was that the Liberation Committee was the host headquartered in Dar es Salaam and it had a lot of problems. And one of the problems uh, was because of Nkrumah's mistrust of Nyerere, that he was not really a freedom fighter for the liberation of Africa because he was a compromised agent of, he was compromised to imperialism. And Nyerere's reaction in that meeting, if you, you read the speech, was also a sharp critique and, and reaction to what Nkrumah was saying. So there, there were those kind of exchange, but later Nyerere, I think, reflected and in uh, 1997, he came out to say, yes, Nkrumah was right, and probably we were wrong in challenging his idea of immediate African unity. Then, 1963, he attended 1965, uh, the agenda uh, kind of collapsed. I wanted to contribute in those two. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Zossi, before I go to you, I mean, for your reflections on any of those questions, there's a specific question for you from Faisal Garba. And Faisal is asking, considering the limits of even the most radical nationalist project and the continuous hollowing out of the public sector on the continent, how do you think a sovereign national project, grounded, of course, in class politics, and that takes gender seriously. How far do you think can it take us? Zossi, are you there with us? Yes, please, I'm here. And, and thank you for, for that question. Um, I, I, Faisal is right to raise this question about the sovereign national project, however progressive it is, and its possibilities at a, at a time uh, like this. I still think it has value. In, in addressing the existential problems of, of, of the majority of people, in actualizing citizenship, but even most, most importantly, as one aspect of the Pan-Africanist struggle, because um, the nation states and, and, and its, and its uh, involvement with other African states is one side of the building blocks of the Pan-African struggle. So we need um, developmental states, which are alive to their responsibilities and, and um, participating with other states can, to build a, a united Africa. The other side of this, of, of the project, has to do with the uh, Pan-Africanism of the people. And I think there we've seen a bit more progress in terms of integration in, in, in all sorts of ways, in terms of culture and the arts, 
in economic um, relations, in migration, and, and, and so on. But at the same time, it's, it's also very complicated and many times compromised by state weaknesses. So we see um, that um, much of the progress people have made at the, uh, at, in their integration is challenged by class and gender contradictions, is challenged by xenophobia and tribalism and so on. So um, no, no matter the, the, the um, limitations of the sovereign national project, and um, I agree with those who spoke in before me that if it does not take Pan-Africanism seriously, it's not going to go far in, in, in the conjunction in which we find ourselves. I still think that it, it has salience and it has a role to play and, and citizens should be interested in the kind of states that we are, we are building at a time like this. Any other panelists want to intervene uh, before I go to what's going to be the last round? Okay, so here's a question in French and Comrade Comba, Comrade Comba Diop is here. Thank you for your posing your question in French. I have it now translated. I, I do not know French, but thanks to comrades who've done it. Uh, so Comba wants to know whether in light of Nairere about the, about the current preoccupations with race, environment and health uh, in light of Nairere and uh, does your book development as rebellion address these issues so that's kumba's question i see two other uh, bigger questions here uh, from ahmed ibrahim who's talking of somalia emma thank you for your question and he says i wonder to what extent was nairere's utilization of socialism for nation building shared by other african post colonial socialist regimes uh, he says that he knows that in the case of somalia the adoption of socialism in 1972 was driven to a large extent by the perceived need to undermine regionalism and tribalism and to build the nation and the nationalist sentiment uh, so that's his reflection and question. We have another one from Adventino Banjwa at the Makarere Institute. Uh, Adventino says, one line that cuts through all three books is the idea of men make history. Or what, women make history or men make history? That's why Adventino to, to clarify. Uh, but men make history within circumstances they encounter. Uh, but women of vision and talent, he says men, but women of vision and talent play a critical role in shaping strategic turns that history takes. Can we hear more from the panelists on this position in light of debates on the form of power and the nature of agency itself? Uh, so uh, that are the two uh, points or two questions that I'll take for this round or three questions I'll take for this round and hand it over back to the panelists. And there are loads of thanks to all the speakers I, I see in the chat box. So any reflections, Professor Shivji, Dr. Saida, Dr. Kamata, Dr. Zodzi. Yeah, on the, on the last question about uh, men and women making history, the circumstances that they find, but uh, men and women of uh, talent, etc., etc., et um, do make a difference. That's precisely the the, the argument of, uh, of of book three. It's precisely the argument of book three, and I think it points out at various conjunctures what possible. Uh, 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 action could have been taken, which Nere could not do, and he was in a position to take. So I think that that probably is very interesting, that uh, the biography in book three, uh, in a sense, validates that dictum, which originally, of course, comes from Marx. Uh, so that will be my answer to, to, to that. On the question of, uh, the first question that was asked about public health and so on, no. The book does not directly deal with these issues um, because I think uh, it, was, it, was, it was sort of submerged under the very 
whole issue of development, etc. There's one point that I wanted to react to, which I forgot on George's uh, 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 reflections, uh, comments, which was about uh, Nkrumah and Pan-Africanism, that you, Nkrumah had to have a national base, which is true. But what is interesting, the case of Nkrumah, is that when he came back, actually came back with the idea of West African Federation. But of course, realized that it, it had to have a base. But once Ghana became independent, I think to his credit, he immediately set upon establishing all Africa People's Conferences, bringing together liberation movements, trade unions, and the independent states that were there. And this was before even OAU was formed. Of course, he was disappointed his outcome was not what he was expecting. But it is very interesting that uh, in Kuma, you must grant him that credit, that his mind was set on it. Okay? So it is not something that he thought about it later, but it was very much, very, 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 very much there. And I think he pursued it through his life. Um, I think that is all I have to say. And, and, and I think Kamat has pointed out the whole question of debate between Kuruma and, and, and Nyerere, the gradualist and so on. It's interesting that the arguments that Kuruma was making for African unity were almost exactly the same yeah. that Nyerere was making for East African Federation. If we don't unite now, we will never unite. Both of them are not successful, and both of them have improved right. To this day, we do not have East African Federation. To this day, we do not have African United States of Africa. Now, without interrupting, Professor Shivji, one goes yes. the arguments for Bandung as well. Yes, yes, yes. Just a reflection. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, so I think, I think, uh, uh, that issue has been burning issue, and it's only narrow nationalists who have given up altogether the idea of, of, of pan Africanism. And I think that was pointed out, pointed out in, in, our, in our discussion. But the first generation nationalists, and this I often argued, that African nationalists became African nationalists from pan Africanism. They were all, all pan Africanists. Even people like Banda were pan Africanists. So the anti-colonial struggle, by necessity almost, had to be waged in their own individual countries. But they were pan-Africans. After coming to power, as Kuruma had predicted, as Jarrah had predicted, they developed Western interests. And they all gave up pan-Africanism. So I think those are important reflections on, on, on our history. And it does tell us a lot about, about pan-Africanism. And the other point that about uh, nationalism and the potency of it today, I often quote uh, dictum from Michael Cabral. It seems to me that it still stands and makes sense, which is that he was saying that African independence government is a national liberation movement in power, meaning that it's not stages, it is not over, it is a process. If it stops that, then, of course, it will not be able to achieve either liberation or emancipation, and definitely not sustain anti imperialism. So, he argued that so long as imperialism exists, African liberation movement in power, in, in, at independence can only be a, a, a national liberation movement in power. The struggle, the struggle continues. Okay. I think thank you, Professor. Uh, I invite any other reflections from any of the other panelists. If there are, friends, we're getting close to the time we have allotted for this very interesting webinar, which has thrown up a load of questions. And I personally think that. 
perhaps uh, we in future need to have a longer session on the issue of futures of nationalism uh, that's the point uh, professor you were raising uh, uh, on on how it has exhausted itself uh, and and what are the dimensions on which it has exhausted itself zozi you added several other layers to that debate uh, and i think that's an interesting dialogue to have uh, particularly at this time when class forces and forces uh, are looking forward to that kind of a solidarity discussion on how to challenge the regressions uh, and the all the exhaustions and all the neoliberal takeovers and all the chauvinistic takeovers of the idea of nationalism itself uh, the rise of nativism the rise of xenophobia the rise of ugly forces the rise of religion and i think some of those issues we we've, we've sort of pointed to today among several others it be important to have an idea on what futures hold out and I, i think that's something that i'll 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 request all our co-organizers to think of uh, to take forward uh, but words of gratitude are in order for now given as we come towards the end of this particular very interesting session i see loads of thank yous at the chat box uh, which we will save off uh, for all our panelists uh, also requests for uh, the book which was released today uh, so yes uh, do feel free to write to professor saida kamata and isa uh, for for your for your reflections on the book and for your requests for the book but a word of gratitude from our end from my end to all the panelists today thank you so much it's been an honor and a singular privilege uh, to moderate this session you are tall figures professor isa shiv ji thank you so much professor saida thank you so much Pro professor nagwanza kamata thank you zozi sister and professor thank you so much for really inspiring us today my words of gratitude also go to all the co-organizers from the sam moyo institute of agrarian studies to walter chambati and steve meberi and other colleagues walter and steve are with us at this discussion my words of gratitude also go to the members of the agrarian south network professor paris yaros and professor praveen jha and of course isa and myself and zozi also part of it were here today thank you professor paris and professor praveen for being here and and co-organizing this my words of gratitude go to my own team joseph rajiv grover joseph mathai rajiv grover and hit their team so lalit and their other members priyanka who have been on the whatsapp sharing your questions and certainly for all those who joined us a lot of members from kodesria a lot of members from other parts of asia uh, kodesia in africa friends for those who uh, who in asia or or in other spaces may not know kodesia is a leading research think tank uh, several senior activists and several scholars and students joined us today thank you so much for being with us today here uh, as i said in the beginning this is an on ongoing series it's a fortnightly series the specters of crisis and rays of hope and we'll be back soon back after two weeks on the 12th of august with another very interesting debate and a debate on china uh, we have we we going to this is titled china's new development challenges i assume also pre and post covid development challenges professors dr sitsui and laukinchi will be the key speakers to this session professor praveen jha from the jawaharlal nehru university is the discussant and joshua nyoni from the sam moyo institute will be moderating us this is on 12th august at the same time i take this opportunity to all who are here today to invite you back to join that debate 
And this is Sandeep Chatra from ActionAid Association India. With those words of gratitude, concluding this session, thanking you all once again and signing out. Thank you. Bye-bye and have a good, good night, a good afternoon or a good evening wherever you are. Bye-bye.